Welcome to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons Roundtable Panel Discussion. I'm Caitlin Clark, and I'm joined by three renowned plastic surgeons and ASPS members. Dr. Ashley Amalfi, a plastic and reconstructive surgeon in Rochester, New York, who focuses on procedures of the breast and body, particularly mommy makeovers. Dr. Ryan Neinstein, a board-certified plastic surgeon with a practice in New York City dedicated to body contouring procedures. And Dr. Anna Steve, a New York City board-certified plastic surgeon who specializes in all forms of breast augmentation and reconstruction. And today, we're here to discuss the motivation behind the millennial plastic surgery boom. So Dr. Neinstein, what is a millennial? Let's kick it off there. I think the most common thing that we can all agree on is millennials are typically between, born between 1980 and 2000 so-called net generation. They really kind of grew up, and I'm part of this generation, with the internet mm -hmm. at the turn of the 21st century. When I think of culture and I think of millennials, some of the characteristics that pop out and that influence the things we're gonna be talking about today. They're confident, they're opt optimistic, mm -hmm. they're tolerant, but some of the key features are delayed family planning. People are getting you know, married later, having kids later. Mm -hmm. People are congregating in bigger cities, more focus on education. And I think a lot of these unique elements to this generation, coupled with the exposure to the internet mm -hmm. and the various facets of social media, will create this whole new generation of plastic surgery patients. Yeah, I would agree. And Dr. Amalfi, historically, the most common age group to get plastic surgery was the 45 and above crowd. But now someone between the ages of 18 and 34 is statistically more likely to get plastic surgery than someone over the age of 55. Do you think this shift has been a long time coming? Oh, absolutely. I think this is a generation who really takes pride in how they look and how that makes them feel. And so I think people were just waiting and sort of unhappy with things about their body until a later age when they could afford to do things. And I think this is sort of an affluent group who feels like, I can afford to do this and I want to do this for myself. And they're taking that back and doing what it is that they need to do to feel well about themselves. And so we fully support that. And do you feel like the pandemic um, has really influenced this as well? Like people now have more disposable income to then spend on themselves, especially this age group? I think that the pandemic really changed people's values, right? So everyone realized, wow, anything can happen at any time and I wanna feel good now. So why am I thinking about this breast augmentation? I've been thinking about it for years. I'm just gonna do it because that instant gratification is now something that we're seeing you know, across generations. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Neinstein, your practice focuses exclusively on breast and body contouring procedures like breast augmentations, liposuctions, tummy tucks. These are exactly the surgeries that are booming for millennials. Have you noticed your patient population becoming younger and younger? I think my patient population is not just becoming younger and younger, but becoming more sophisticated and more sophisticated. As like I was saying before, with this delayed family planning, a more of a commitment to education, more of a commitment to the professional development, these people are focusing on themselves. Mm -hmm. And part of this growth development, kind of um, zigging and zagging up the corporate ladder is gonna be doing anything they can to help them feel better, look better. And um, that all contributes to that, you know, social currency of the things that they're trying to build in their lives. And these procedures, a lot of them are tweaking things that they seem to can't do on their, can't do on their own, mm -hmm. but adds a lot of value in their life. And it's becoming um, more prevalent, more accepted, and um, more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And some people call this millennial generation the wellness generation. And they see you know, cosmetic enhancements and plastic surgeries as all part of the wellness game. Do you find that to be true as well? Yeah, what I find that most of our patients now take incredibly good care of themselves. Mm -hmm. They eat well, they exercise, they're well read, they're well educated. Mm -hmm. Um, and that plastic surgery is part of the wellness cycle. It is not replacing it. It is, I don't want to work out, I'm going to have liposuction. It's, mm -hmm. no, I do work out. This is how far I can take my body. This area bothers me and I want a small tweak, refinement, and I'm sophisticated enough to know that I'm going to outsource that to a board certified <laughs> plastic surgeon to take care of me. Yeah, so it's like they have a 360 view of wellness. Correct. Mm -hmm. Dr. Steve, the term prejuvenate has become buzzy in the aesthetics world when describing the relationship between millennials and plastic surgery. What does this phrase mean exactly? So it really means getting ahead of the game and, and thinking about what you can do now to sort of prevent aging. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really fitting with the millennial generation that 
you know, they have delayed family planning, but, you know, they want to know what's immediate that mm -hmm. they can take control of in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they don't want to wait necessarily until the effects of aging um, transcend. Mm -hmm. They want to know how they can be proactive. Mm -hmm. Because wouldn't you say that maintenance is easier and, you know, more affordable than waiting and then needing perhaps like a more serious intervention down the line? I think that's very true. And I think the other thing is, it feels better to do something than do nothing. Mm -hmm. And so people like action and people like to take action. And that's very true of the millennial generation as mm -hmm. well. So I think that all plays into it. Right. Like they don't have to live with something that they're unhappy with mm -hmm. kind of or wait for something that they're unhappy with. Mm -hmm. you know? And Dr. Amalfi, do you think that this millennial aesthetic differs from the previous generations? Like what, what kind of look are millennials asking for? Like what kind of aesthetic? Well, I'm really grateful that I think that they want a more natural look. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about millennials, not, you know, the next generation, mm -hmm. not Gen Z, but millennials, I think, want a natural look. So um, I think that they are a fit population. They are moms. They are taking great care of themselves and they don't want to look overdone and overly fake. They just want to look like the best version of themselves. And so I think that that more natural aesthetic um, is really great. And these are the patients who are walking around that you don't know had plastic surgery. And I think that's the ideal, right? I don't want people um, looking at other people in the supermarket and being like, who did that, right? Mm -hmm. You just want them to show up to a party and be like, oh my goodness, she looks amazing, she feels amazing, what's happening? That's the best outcome you can have from plastic surgery and that generation absolutely embraces it. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think it's kind of ironic that some people in this generation also like, chronicle their entire journey on social media? They want it to look supernatural, like they <clears throat> haven't gotten anything done, but then they post everything on social media? I, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the more open and transparent we can be about that, the better, because like like we said, these are patients who are taking good care of themselves. They're doing everything they can. And that's sort of that last piece or that last step that, that they can't control. And that's why they're having surgery. And I think being open about it is great because it's going to give women more confidence to feel like they can do that for themselves as well. And so they're showing that physical transformation. But I think what people are seeing is also that emotional confidence transformation that people have after plastic surgery. And so, I mean, as plastic surgeons, we're grateful for that because it's allowing more and more people to embrace what we do. Mm -hmm. I also think that speaks to the tolerance of the of this generation mm -hmm. that they're going to be they're optimistic to expose themselves mm -hmm. and they're okay with the feedback. Really good, bad and indifferent <laughs> because they're confident. Exactly. Right. It's, yeah. great. it's great. It's an ideal patient. And if you're doing it for you, you don't really care what other people think, right? No. Because you are going to do it to make yourself feel better. Mm -hmm. Dr. Steve, since you're dedicated to all types of breast procedures and breast augmentations have historically been one of the top three most popular plastic surgeries over the years, what have you noticed recently when it comes to this particular procedure in the 30-something crowd? The 30-something crowd, uh, like we already mentioned, is really going for that natural look. Mm -hmm. I'm finding I'm using a lot of you know, low-profile implants, moderate-profile implants to achieve that like subtle look that keeps people wondering. Mm -hmm. um, and I find the other trend is that um, in, in the 30-something women, they come in very educated mm -hmm. about you know, all the different options. They want to really know um, the details behind what's going on. And I think that's, that's partly um, because of their generation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of women who are not the millennial generation who maybe had breast augmentation earlier and are coming in for their breast revisions are saying, you know, I wish I would have been more informed and take, taken more of mm. the consultation process, more of the decision making into my own hands. Mm -hmm. And so there is really a difference and a shift in patients seeking out information, becoming informed. And I find the millennial generation, they seek that information primarily through social media. Interesting. And so that's a big shift as well. You know, it's not necessarily so much that they're Googling, but they're looking on social media for informative, patient-directed um, information mm -hmm. that they can keep themselves educated and really be involved in the decision-making process. So I think that that's a, an important transition as well. And I find that's really helpful in really getting down to the bottom of what sort of an aesthetic they want to achieve mm -hmm. because they've really thought a lot about it and they know a little bit about it in, mm. in terms of like, you know, implant sizing, profiles, those sorts of things. So it really, mm -hmm. um, 
it creates some good conversation mm -hmm. uh, between the physician and the patient to achieve what they really want. I think there's definitely a big paradigm shift and surgeons need to brace themselves. Patients are coming <laughs> armed, you know, they're well researched. Mm -hmm. They know how to use the internet well. <clears throat> they're getting good research. Yeah. They're asking tough questions and they're coming ready. You know, they want to have a real conversation. Mm -hmm. They're not just going to say, what can you do for me? And what should you do? And just let you do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And I think surgeons need to embrace that actually, because mm -hmm. I think you can reorient, recalibrate to a tighter surgical procedure that should have a more predictable outcome mm -hmm. because of the um, education on both sides. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the other piece is they're coming knowing us as well mm -hmm. because they're connecting with us on social media before they get there. So they come knowing a ton about the procedures, sometimes asking for procedures by name, you know, the way we yeah. would book them, which is something we've never seen before. But then they also sit down for that consultation and feel like, Dr. Amalfi, I already know you. How was your vacation? The kids are growing up so fast. And, and that level of comfort that social media has allowed us takes a little bit of that anxiety off because this is a big thing for the patient. They've been thinking about this for years. They're sitting there, they're often nude. And if they already have that level of comfort and they already really know what they're setting themselves up for procedure wise, um, it's just gonna help us have a patient who really knows um, and has realistic expectations. And that's more than we can ask for. Mm -hmm. I mean, we tend to want to spend time with, in our lives with people that we like mm -hmm. or that we, you know, do similar things and have shared interests. And that's one thing that social media has been great. I find a lot of the patients, wherever in the world they're coming to see me, we have very similar values. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's family oriented. We're into, you know, fitness, fashion, fun, but it's like really focused on like surgery and family. And a lot of these patients that I'm working on, it's like, it literally doesn't matter if they're in, you know, Singapore, LA, New York, or, you know, Manitoba, we're just very similar and we, and we get along incredibly well. Mm -hmm. We're not just kind of, you know, randomly meeting. There's a real, you know, we're, there's a, there's a real drive towards similar minded people working together. Yeah. That was going to be my next question. It has to be a little bit of a relief for you too, when patients come in and they have done their homework and they know that. Um, you, they followed you on social media, they've gotten to know you as a human being and as a person, and you know they're taking this seriously. And also, you know that they've gotten their information from a reliable source because there is so much misinformation out there on social media and on the internet. Does that provide like some sense of relief for you, Dr. Moffey? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you want them having a trusted and reliable source. And mm -hmm. so if they're coming to our social media platforms and ending up on our websites, then you know that they're getting information that's really important is gonna make them well informed. And we love that they're connected with those networks and mm -hmm. it shows that they're invested, that they're a smart, educated patient, and that's gonna help us get the best results. Mm -hmm. I think it raises the bar on everything. Yeah. And it's a tougher, we're, we're held to a higher standard. Patients are expecting more and um, they're demanding more. And that's great, actually. If, yeah. As long as if you're someone who's in a real pursuit of excellence, you want to be held to a higher standard. Absolutely. And this is a constant evolution, uh -huh. which means you cannot rely on, you know, patients are going to know things almost before surgeons know things now. <laughs> they're going to ask you about procedures. They're going to ask you about papers that come out that you may not have even read yet. <laughs> so, um, you need to have done your homework too then. Exactly. Yeah. So, devices, I mean, you cannot, you cannot rest on things you learned in training. Mm -hmm. So, the practices that are delivering what the patients want are in a constant state of evolution. So Dr. Neinstein, most millennials came of age in a time when plastic surgery was becoming more and more normalized with like reality TV shows like Dr. 90210, which I grew up watching. Um, and now that they're older and they have you know, more disposable income, do you think it's surprising that they're choosing to spend you know, this money that they have on themselves for cosmetic enhancements? No, but first of all, I think the reality shows and everything, like most things, the pendulum swings very far one way mm -hmm. with the reality shows, and then it settles in the middle. Mm -hmm. But I think people are choosing their disposable income because they have disposable income. You know, if you're not getting married to your mid-30s and you're focused on your career, you're going to have a long period of time where you don't have um, financial commitments mm -hmm. and time commitments to others. And I think the way they look and feel about themselves gives a lot of social currency. And that social currency is not just in how they go and find mates, how they go and find friends, but how they um, enter the corporate world. Mm -hmm. So anything they can do to build social currency, build currency and confidence mm -hmm. um, is gonna help people. And that, you know, these are all just tools in their toolkit of life. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, this is a really modern way. And it's really, 
um, embracing the attitudes of the society. Wonderful. I mean, you see this generation embracing preventative care, preventative beauty, and I think that what we do is essentially just the highest form and extension of that beauty industry. And so when you see them taking care of themselves in so many other ways, their bodies and their minds, that it's not surprising that plastic surgery has just become that natural extrapolation of that, where mm -hmm. patients are doing absolutely anything they can in this generation to look and feel their best. Mm -hmm. And so, Dr. Steve, what are your thoughts on whether there's like an acceptable or a right age to begin considering plastic surgery or a cosmetic enhancement, even if it's something as simple as, you know, an injectable or Botox? I think the age is very individual. Mm -hmm. it, it varies. And I think there's life aspects that really contribute to that. So when we're speaking about the millennial generation and they have delayed family planning, it, it does often come up, you know, should I be waiting until... I'm done my family planning. Um, should I wait till I have my kids before mm -hmm. I start undergoing aesthetic breast surgery? Mm -hmm. And um, we know that, you know, usually you can safely breastfeed, you can safely have children, and many women take all of that information into account. And they say, you know what, I want to enjoy the results now. Mm -hmm. And so I think whereas before, maybe women were having children younger and they were deciding to do those procedures after their, their family planning was done. Mm -hmm. Now, in many ways, they're, they're deciding to do them before their family planning. Mm. And I think it's just a bit of a transition and navigating at what time is the right age is very, very individual and very independent. Mm -hmm. And there's not really a ton of merit or glory anymore into waiting, right? No, I, I would say um, to some degree, uh, I think people um, have a hard time with the delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. Really, like people like to enjoy the now, yeah. the immediacy. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Malfi, because so much of our anatomies are determined by genetics, would it be true that a problem area or a concern isn't even necessarily due to aging? Like, for example, like a 25-year-old could have droopy or hooded eyelids not because of aging, because they're 25, but just because of their genetic profile? Absolutely. I mean, we're all unique individuals. And so every part of our anatomy from head to toe can be different. It doesn't mean that it's abnormal, but there's just so many variations of normal. So whether you're talking about facial features or breasts or body types, those are things that really concern people. And if it's affecting their quality of life, it's absolutely reasonable to take care of something like that earlier before you would consider it the natural aging process. And so we definitely are seeing younger patients who are bothered by these things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's absolutely acceptable and uh, a very big part about what we do. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Dinestein, based on the data from this year's ASPS Trends Report, early intervention um, is less about vanity than it is about patients wanting to look and feel their best, which you touched on earlier, you know, regardless of their age. Um, is this type of mentality or perspective something that you're seeing in your patients? Yeah, I mean, people are always looking for a boost, mm -hmm. but I really think it has the aesthetic in mind that they're looking for. Um, we see, we've always been at our practice in New York about long, lean, elegant lines, natural results. People want to look amazing. They don't want to look done. Like Ashley was saying, like Anna was saying, people don't want it to be like, you look great. Who's your plastic surgeon? Mm -hmm. Just you look great. And, the, and, and that natural, elegant result is, is actually a pretty big paradigm shift in plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. Plastic surgery, I think for a long time, has had kind of over the top results. People, it still has that in certain places. And that's fine. People are going to have you know, people are gonna have different tastes. Mm -hmm. But for what we notice in New York and what draws so many people from around the world is this kind of elegant, long, lean, natural look mm -hmm. and things that we can do to help people achieve that, whether or not it's a genetic issue or changes from pregnancy has really given a lot of confidence and it's amazing to see the impact we've been making on patients. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like the because of technology, recoveries have gotten shorter, more abbreviated, and that makes it more accessible to patients? No, I think the recovery, I think the recoveries have gotten a little shorter mm. because patients are just healthier people. Mm -hmm. I remember my aunt got liposuction in the 90s and it looked like she was hit by a train for like a month because of all of the bruising. But you know, you see before and afters now on social media from, you know, respect. No, that still happens, by the way. <laughs> my yeah. patients get bruised. Yeah, biology is biology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't think it was that excessive, though, as it used to be because of the VASER and all the different types of technologies now. At the end of the day, the results, to get the results that we want, there's mm -hmm. going to be downtime. Mm -hmm. There's going to be bruising. There's going to be swelling. 
we can reduce or minimize it in certain ways based on the health of the patient, getting them, you know, doing all the things we do before, during, and after, mm -hmm. but we can't get rid of downtime. Yeah. yeah, we just have to support them in that yeah. downtime because these are really healthy patients. So they're like dying to know when they can get on their Peloton. Mm -hmm. And so you have to give them very specific guidelines. You know, you can do a low impact ride this time and then you can progress to this, this, and this. And so they're very specific questions that the patients are asking. And I think as long as preoperatively you give them that roadmap of what that recovery mm -hmm. looks like and you help them understand that the better they are at adhering to those um, restrictions, the better their outcome. And then the quicker, once they get to that healing point, they're gonna just be right back where they were in their lives mm -hmm. and their level of activity. And so it just takes a lot of coaching because this is a really active, <laughs> outgoing, population. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what we want because they recover quickly, they're healthy, yeah. um, and it's exactly the type of patients that we want to attract. But what's interesting, I do think that millennial generation specifically is changing the way surgeons do post-op. For instance, I would guess, Ashley, that your breast augmentation, when they can go back to exercise, has changed over the last few years. Oh yeah, it's, <laughs> everything is just a little bit sooner. I, I remember in training, yeah. it was like, oh, you can't exercise for 12 weeks. Oh, they'd never do it, that's the thing. So you really have to look critically at like the results and you know when are those changes happening at that level of healing so that you can give them tangible things to do because people don't want all that downtime. Right. Um, they wouldn't do the operation. They wouldn't. Right. They, so yeah, they can't take that much time off of working mm -hmm. out mentally, uh, which is a good thing. Right, and so because this is the wellness generation, are they starting from a better point then than most people previously because they're already eating well, working out, they're fitter. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we want. We want a patient who's at a stable weight, who has a great exercise plan, who has a really healthy diet. Um, it's going to make them the best surgical candidate because they're healthy and that risk profile absolutely goes down when you're taking good care of yourself. And I think they bounce back better because they're fit and healthy. It's like being fit and healthy in your pregnancy. That delivery is so much smoother than if you really just mm -hmm. let it go and eat all the ice cream. You've got a long road ahead of you. And so I think that patients being so prepared and so well cared for absolutely is making them have uh, better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Nineteen, I really liked what you said earlier about being the patients now being partners in their recovery with their plastic surgeons because they are so dedicated to their wellness routines. Do you find that that also makes their recoveries a little bit easier? Well, another paradigm shift in our practice to, to reflect the demands of what the patients want mm -hmm. is more active recovery. Mm -hmm. It's not, here, have an operation, here's a piece of paper that was, you know, photocopied from 1984, see so you in three months. <laughs> we see, the, we want to see the patients daily. Mm -hmm. They want dedicated 24-7 access to, you know, me, mm -hmm. Dr. Steve, Dr. Funderburg, our nurse practitioner. Also, they want an administrator mm -hmm. because they're going to be doing massages, diets, they want certain medications, they want it delivered on, like, these are active this is a new, it's almost, it's a whole new part of the practice is recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's true that it's not a one size fits all when it comes yeah. to recovery. Right. And I think that that is something that is a big shift right now as well. Like but, people aren't being treated one in the same. And that's why you'll see more teams of surgeons develop. Like you work with four other surgeons. We have three surgeons. It is very difficult to be on an island. Yeah. And as we all know, as the island of knowledge grows, so does the shore of ignorance. <laughs> but so the, you, this, you need a lot of people involved. It's not just having people to answer the phone. It's having different intellectual horsepower and perspectives to help solve complex problems and prevent complex problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think with this generation too is if you shift your framework a little bit from telling them what they can't do and shift it to telling them what they can do and provide them with some things that they can really be actively involved in, mm -hmm. that really helps make them feel like they're a part of the recovery process and that they're able to do some things and take some things into their own control. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, a bit of a language shift or a framework, mm -hmm. you know, rather than giving them the list of like, do don't, 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 mm -hmm. you know, you can do this, you can do that. Yeah. And that goes back to your um, point earlier about people loving action. They want to feel like they are empowered to take certain steps in their recovery mm -hmm. because it's not just what's happening on the table, it's how you're taking care of yourself after to really prolong the results and set yourself up for success. And of course, it's, un it's important that they understand their limitations, mm -hmm. but if you sort of emphasize what they can do, I feel like that really helps. Mm -hmm. Dr. Steve, any final thoughts to wrap us up? Yeah, I think that um, it's really great that plastic surgery has shifted to be um, an area where there's really no, no need for irony in the fact that plastic surgery can give you a natural result. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Nineteen, how about you? No, I'm just excited for the, the challenge ahead. As more patients are asking for more from their surgeons, it's asking us more from ourselves. And we're growing and becoming um, a more dynamic specialty. Mm -hmm. Dr. Malfi? I'm just excited to see that plastic surgery is, is an extension of beauty and it's actually an experience. So it's not transactional, it's not just an operation. It's everything that you're doing to take care of yourselves before and after. And encompassing that whole care team is just an absolute new outlook on what we do as board certified plastic surgeons. Mm -hmm. And do you think the stigma of plastic surgery and sort of the like shame around it has also decreased too with like the rise of social media and everyone chronicling their journey? Absolutely, mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful for it because it is just a normalized part of what we do to take care of ourselves, mm -hmm. mind and body. and. I'm just really excited to see how this generation ages because we are taking such better care of ourselves than the baby boomers did. So very exciting things for plastic surgery. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. Dr. Malfi, Dr. Nineteen, Dr. Steve, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.